back to confidence intervals. What we're dealing with in confidence intervals is kind of similar to example F from the previous video on sampling distribution. Maybe you recall that the idea here is I told you that the mean household income is 60 grand and I gave you some standard deviation, I think it was 40 grand, and I asked you between which two values do the middle 90% of averages fall? So we drew this picture, we said, well, 90% in the middle, 5% over here and 5% over here. And we were able to find these two values, 49,000 and 71,000, give or take, that create this range and so our conclusion up here, I don't think we actually wrote it, is maybe note from this example, we can be 90% sure. And when I say 90%, that's because of this 90%. 90% sure that a sample average, note we're not talking about one household up here, we're talking about the average of 36 households that a sample average of 36 households is within, let's see, from 60,000 up to 71,000 is about $11,000. And from 60,000 down to 49,000 is about $11,000. Maybe just so I don't have to write all the uh, numbers out, I'll just say that's about 11,000. Note from this example, we can be 90% sure that a sample average is within about $11,000 of the population average. And I know that that's a lot to unpack, but recall that the population average mu is what we used to figure out mu sub x bar, which was the center of this picture. And what we don't know up here is the sample average, right? I'm saying in a sample of 36 households, we don't know what the average would be. Give me two numbers so that we're 90% sure that the average falls between those two numbers. So that's what we did up here. We don't know X bar. We do know mu. And we say we're 90% sure that X bar is within $11,000 of mu. X bar is within... 11k of mu and we didn't state our conclusion this way because that wasn't really the relevant information in that problem in that problem the relevant information was just coming up with these two numbers but i just want you to think about what you did here because the logic of what you did here will really inform what we're doing in 4.2 so if you can follow this that what we figured out in that last example is x bar the thing that was unknown in that problem is within eleven thousand dollars of mu or maybe we're not sure but we're at least 90 percent sure of that Turns out that that doesn't matter. Nobody cares that X bar is within $11,000 of mu because think back to what we did on the very first day of this class, the very first video I made for you. I talked about how in statistics in this class, what we're trying to do is estimate population parameters based on sample statistics, based on data from a sample. We got a question about a population. Population's too big. Can't answer that question directly because the population is too big to measure directly. So what do we do? We get a smaller sample and we measure that sample. And then we summarize that sample and we draw conclusions about the population. Think about what's going on here. More in this example, it was weird that somebody told me mu, the population average, and asked me about X bar, the sample average. That's completely backwards, right? Really, it's more likely to know X bar, right? Down here, we knew mu, and we made an inference about X bar. That's backwards. It's much more likely to know X bar and make an inference about mu. Oh, that didn't say inference. Try again. Right, you guys let it slide that these questions were kind of weird. Maybe you didn't even care, didn't think about it. Um, but I gave you these questions. I was like, here's how you answer them. And you're like, all right, now I know how to answer them. I can get my credit on the quiz. But this has nothing to do with what we describe statistics of as the first, in the first week of this class. But this does. And it turns out that we can use what we learned here to answer this question. Right, what will happen with confidence intervals and every single confidence intervals question is we will be given X bar. Somebody will tell you that. 
and you will make a conclusion about mu. And that makes a lot more sense. Your question, whatever we're talking about, this was household income, fine. You don't know household income from the entire population, right? Because there's too many households in the population, whatever your population is. But you know what you could do? You could randomly select, I don't know, 100 households in that population. That would be your sample. And you could measure, you could ask, you could survey the households in that sample and calculate a sample average. You come up with the sample average. That's very realistic. That happens. That's what you do with statistics. Unfortunately, your question is not about the sample average. It's about the population average. But that's okay. If you know your sample average, you can make a conclusion about your population average. That's our whole process of statistics. And that's what we finally do in 4.2. And it turns out that the way we'll do it will be almost identical to what we did here. Because if X bar is within $11,000 of mu, if the sample average is within $11,000 of the population average, then... The population average is within $11,000 of the sample average. If you're within 20 feet of me, I'm within 20 feet of you, right? If the distance between these two guys is 11 grand, if this guy is 11 grand away from this guy, then this guy's 11 grand away from this guy. We can do things almost the same with confidence intervals as we did in this example with inverse norm and normal CDF. Let me take you through it. Suppose mu. Now, I'm not even going to write the symbol. Suppose the population average household income is unknown. Yeah, that makes sense. You shouldn't know these population parameters. It's weird that we knew it over here. Suppose this is unknown. In a random sample of 36 households, The, maybe to be really clear here, sample average income was, and maybe just to prove a point, I'm going to make it the exact same as what the population average income was up here. But note that we're talking about different things. Up here, somebody told you the population average income, which is weird. Down here, I'm telling you the sample average income. I just happen to be using the same number, $60,000. Suppose the population average household income is unknown. In a random sample, period. In a random sample of 36 households, the average income was 60 grand. The average household, I guess, income. Now there's one little weird assumption I have to make. Suppose I, and maybe I'll even write somehow, know that sigma, the population standard deviation is, and I'm going to leave it the same as what it was up here. The population standard deviation was given to you to be 40 grand up here. I'm going to leave it as 40 grand. A comment on that. It's weird that you know one population parameter and not the other one. Right? The population average household income, this is mu, is unknown. You don't know that. That makes sense. You shouldn't know the population parameters. But down here, I'm being like, hey, pretend you do know sigma. That's weird. Really, you shouldn't know sigma, the population standard deviation. Maybe instead you should know S, the sample standard deviation. Just like you know X bar, the sample average, it would make a lot more sense to know S, the sample standard deviation. Turns out things don't work as nicely if you don't know sigma. So the first time through this, we're going to pretend you know sigma. It's an unrealistic assumption, but let it slide. It'll make your work easier. We'll answer questions assuming we know this, and then we'll go back and revisit this several times, it turns out, in this class, and we'll start to fix these assumptions that aren't 100% correct, and by the end of the class, we'll be doing these things without these weird, unrealistic assumptions. Anyways, don't get lost in this. We know X bar, the sample average. We're trying to make an inference about mu, the population average. Unrealistically, we know sigma, the population standard deviation. Fine. I know enough information to draw this picture. Right? I can draw my sampling distribution. And it's a sampling distribution because we're talking about averages, the average of these 36 people, which is what this 60 grand was. But instead of putting mu in the middle, since I don't know what mu is, I'm going to put x bar in the middle. x bar is 60 grand. Because since 
X bar is within $11,000 of mu. I know that mu must be within $11,000 of X bar. What I'm saying is up here, I'm making a guess. I don't know where X bar is. It's somewhere in here, but I know where it is relative to mu. Down here, I don't know where mu is, but I know where it is relative to X bar. So now my center is gonna be X bar. What you'll see is that our center in this section will be given by X bar. $60,000. I know that doesn't quite make sense yet, but that's okay. Note that if you go back to this document, it says that your center is X bar when we're dealing with confidence intervals. And as these videos go on in the next one, maybe I'll try to explain more about why that makes sense. That's my center. What I want to know is about mu, my population average. Well, I'll never be 100% sure about mu, my population average. Just like over here, I wasn't 100% sure that X bar was in this range. I was 90% sure, but I'm never gonna be 100% sure because this distribution, technically speaking, goes infinitely far in both directions. So down here, it's not realistic for me to say what is mu, but maybe I could ask you, here's your prompt, create a 90% confidence interval for mu. Right, the population average, the thing that you don't know, give me two values so that you're 90% sure that mu falls somewhere in between those two values. Well, all that translates to is finding a number over here and a number over here so that we capture 90% of the area in the middle because one of our interpretations of the area underneath the curve is the probability that the thing that we're looking for falls in there. Right, so if this area is 90%, if I could just find the number that goes here and the number that goes here, I'd be done. Right, that's what a 90% confidence interval for mu is, is the number that goes here and the number that goes here. Well, I could figure out those numbers if I just knew shape, center, and spread. You do, knew, do know shape. It's normal. That's why I drew it this way, or sometimes I put it in approximately normal. Either way is fine. Wait, how'd you know that? Central limit theorem. As long as n is greater than or equal to 30, we don't care about the shape of the parent distribution. The sampling distribution is automatically normal. So for shape, I can say it's normal because n is greater than or equal to 30. Either n better be greater than or equal to 30 or it better tell you the parent distribution is approximately normal, in which case we get it for free. What about the spread? Well, it kind of makes sense that we're gonna take the standard deviation that was given to us, sigma in this case, but not just leave it as sigma, divide it by the square root of n because that's what we've been doing for the sampling distribution. Same thing here. It's gonna be 40,000 divided by the square root of 36. Note that shape, center, and spread here is the exact same as it was in this example. Shape, approximately normal. Center, 60,000. Spread, 40,000 divided by the, 30, the square root of 36. The area that I'm looking for, this 90% is the same. This answer is going to be the same as this answer down here. It's the exact same answer. My answer is going to be 49,034 up to 70,966. You're like, you're really telling me that with confidence intervals, all I do is use the inverse norm function twice? In fact, no. You could. It works out that way, but don't, because there's an easier way, and the easier way will translate better when we revisit confidence intervals in more challenging situations later in this class. So how do you do it? How do we recover these exact same two answers in an easier way? Well, your calculator's gonna do it for you. What you do is you hit the stat key. That's already different, right? Remember, inverse norm was under the distribution menu, second and then variables. That's not what you're doing. You just hit the stat key. That takes you into this menu. We've been under the edit list a bunch. That's how you enter data into lists. We've been under the calculate menu a little bit. That's where we did one variable statistics. We'll do a little bit more under calculator in this class. But what we're going to do with this example for the first time is take you into the column where we're going to spend the majority of the rest of the class. It's this tests column. And the tests column is what you use anytime you're doing hypothesis testing or confidence intervals. Everything that ends in the word test corresponds with hypothesis testing, which is what you learn in 4.3. Everything that ends in the word interval corresponds with confidence intervals, which is what we're learning in 4.2. If you scroll down, you'll see a lot of things that end in the word interval. And that's because we're gonna go back and revisit confidence intervals a bunch of times in this class. There's gonna be a bunch of different confidence intervals. 
the very first thing that ends in the word interval is Z interval. And it turns out that Z interval is what you use anytime you're in this section. It will turn out that the reason you can use Z interval is because you know sigma here. But more on that later. I don't think we can really distinguish between the different interval calculator functions until we learn more instances to use confidence intervals. Since this is the first one, maybe just trust me that you're always going to be using Z interval until told otherwise. If you select Z interval here, it'll ask you some questions. It'll say, I, your calculator, can create a confidence interval for you if you have sample data. Right? That's what we had here. We had sample data. X bar here gave you my sample. You could tell your calculator the data explicitly. You could be like the first household made 58 grand. The second household made 75 grand. The third household made 35 grand, whatever. You can do that if you put your data into a list. Or you can just tell your calculator statistics about the data if somebody else already summarized it for you. In this example, it's already summarized for you. Somebody told you X bar. X bar was 60,000. So I'll put in 60,000 here. Sigma is 40,000. This is a little bit tricky. It's really tempting to put in 40,000 divided by the square root of 36 because that's the spread. And you'd think that you should put in the spread because the spread is what this picture will use. You actually don't. You put in sigma and n separately, n was 36, and your calculator takes that sigma and this n and puts it into this formula for you. The reason that's confusing is because when you were under the inverse norm function in your calculator, it asked you for sigma, but it really wanted the spread. So at an earlier time in this class, this was center and this was spread, which is really confusing because right now in this class, when we go under tests and go to Z interval, this no longer means center and spread, or this no longer means spread. This really means sigma. How am I ever going to keep that straight? If this says sigma, it wants sigma always except for if you're using inverse norm and normal CDL. So anytime you're in Z interval or any interval or any test, when it says sigma, it really wants sigma, not the spread. It will calculate the spread for you. There's sigma, there's N. It can use that to calculate the spread. The last thing it wants is my confidence level. Remember we wanted a 90% confidence interval? So all I got to do is tell it 90%. Some of your calculators, you can put in 90 and it'll figure out what you mean. But some of you will get an error if you do that. So put in 0.9 or 0.90, put it in as a decimal. <clears throat> if I hit calculate here, it will do the inverse norm function behind the scenes. It does, what's programmed in for Z interval in your calculator is to do inverse norm with this is the center and sorry, with this is the center and this divided by the square root of this is the spread. And it figures out 5% to the left of this value and 95% to the left of this value based on this 90%. It does all that work for you. All the work that you had to do up here, it does it for you when you hit this button. I hit this button, it spits out 49034, which is exactly this number, 7966, which is exactly this number. That's how you make a confidence interval. In the next video, I want to talk more about how I'm going to ask you to do confidence intervals. I'm not going to try to tie this back to previous sections and give you all the intuition behind this. I'm just going to do a couple of examples and show you step one, two, three, four that I will always ask you when I test you on this. It'll be on this week's quiz and on every test I ever give you with confidence intervals. I'm always going to ask you the exact same questions. And I'll get into those on the next video. But what I wanted for this one is really to introduce this idea of confidence intervals. The answer to your confidence interval when it asks you to create a 90% confidence interval is just these two numbers.